you've got your Bibles with you, or whatever you look things up in these days, turn to 1 John chapter 3. We have been making our way through this great, great book, one of the all-time favorites of all time. My life is uh, the book of 1 John, and as we've looked into it, we're really down to the third chapter, where there's kind of a, a turn in the focus. Uh, a lot of the first couple of chapters have to do with obedience and focusing on our commitment to, 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 to Christ. The rest of the book, much of the rest of the book, deals with loving one another. You know, the apostle John is called, nicknamed, the apostle of love. You know, he used the nickname about himself as the apostle that Jesus loved. So that was the reception part. But because of his focus, because he's the primary uh, describer of God's love in the New Testament, he uses the word love more in his book than any other book in the New Testament. John, the gospel of love. John, the apostle of love. And in this case, John, the describer of love. We're going to take some time and look at John chapter 3, and we'll just look at verses 11 through 18 today. And it's just a simple black and white kind of contrast for us today. It says it this way, For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. By the way, the verse right before that kind of had that contrast. You know you're a child of God if you obey him and you love the brothers. Now he's going to go into a bigger description. This is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who knows what love is, no, who hates his brother and sister, is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. Let's bow in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for this uh, passage of Scripture and the encouragement that can come to us about uh, loving versus hating, about following you versus uh, stumbling. Just help us, Lord, as bring this word to light. Bring to our minds all that you want us to learn from it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's uh, jump into this and, and speak about the contrast between hate and love, between hating and loving the mark of the world, the Bible says, and this verse says, is hatred. Now you might say, well, that's not exactly true. There's a lot of nice people in the world. Not everybody hates everybody else. He's drawing a black and white contrast here. And he's not, not looking for the gray in the middle. He's pegging the meter on both sides. Okay? And when you look at the world's ultimate consequence, it's hatred. Because it's controlled by the evil one, by the father of lies. Now, he said earlier in John 3.10 that our paternity test, how we know we're children of God, is because we love the brothers. We love the brothers and sisters, we would say the pl plurality of that. And so he jumps right into murder. You know how sometimes when you're saying how righteous you are or how, not, you know, how you're not too bad, 
You say, well, I've never murdered anybody. Have, have you ever heard that from somebody? We, we'll jump to that end, right? I, I'm not that bad. I've never killed anybody. We always go to that extreme, don't we? So that's kind of what John's doing. He's kind of going to that extreme to say, you know, maybe it's not literal murdering of somebody, but there is that ultimate intent, that ultimate uh, result. And so he's going to bring up someone who literally did murder somebody, (laughs) okay? We're going to talk about Cain, the firstborn son of Adam and Eve, okay? The firstborn, and uh, Adam's firstborn, he hated. I mean, you kind of go, well, wasn't the world living for a long time before? The very first siblings ended up one killing the other. Cain killed Abel. Now, you might not uh, know all of this story. Let me just mention it to you so you got it clearer in your mind. Cain and Abel were both attempting to worship God. It wasn't that Cain had ignored God, but he wasn't following him as God wanted him to. And so God confronted Cain. God confronted Cain and said, you know, this is not what's needed. This is not what's not. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, that it was out of faith that Abel brought the the sacrifice that God told him to, and out of lack of faith that Cain brought an alternative. So when he was confronted, does this ever happen to you? He got mad. Instead of being soft to the confrontation, instead of being open to God's reproof, instead, he got mad. The Bible describes his anger and that he rose up and literally slaughtered his brother. I mean, can you imagine jealousy and hatred so strong? I know some of you can't imagine hatred or anything for a brother or a sibling, right? You know, I'm saying that facetiously. You know, sometimes our, our siblings are the ones that challenge us the most, aren't they? You know, were there ever a time when you were growing up, you said, oh, if I could just, you know, <laughs> we got siblings over here going, you know. Um, well, that's what happened with Cain and Abel. Cain got so upset that he killed his brother. Now, so often we think that destroying the person is going to change the feelings we've got. What happened was just the opposite. He then became not only guilty, not only distant from God, not only angry and rebellious, he ended up judged besides that and paid a huge consequence for that. See, there was an evil bent in Cain's life, even from the beginning, from the earliest on the earth experience, there is a choice to make. And this choice is pointed out for all of us. You can either go against God and follow the world, the evil one, the devil, or you can go with God and follow him and the son, his son, and the love that he has for us. Those are the clear um, examples for us in following after it. So this is what it says about, you know, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning. Cain and Abel are pretty far back, aren't they? We're talking about Genesis chapter 4 and chapter 18. You know, we're talking about way back in the beginning. But it could also be you've heard it from the beginning of your life with God. And in John's case, he heard it from Jesus early in his understanding that we should love one another. Don't be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. How do you know Cain belonged to the evil one? Because of the result of his life. Because of the result. Now let me be real clear. Murderers, someone who's done, who's, who's killed somebody, can receive Christ. I mean, we've got examples. We've got the Apostle Paul, who was about murdering Christians. And he became a believer. We've got David, who was a follower of Christ and ended up murdering somebody. We've got examples of murderers 
who, are fo- who become followers and, 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 and devoted to Christ. So he's not putting them in a category that all of us are in, but he's using the extreme because we often say, well, at least I'm not a murderer. What did Jesus say about murder? What did Jesus say about anger? <laughs> he said, if you harbor anger in your heart, you've committed murder already. Okay? If you call your brother a fool, if you use derogatory terms, you reap judgment from that. So he's trying to get at what is going on on the inside, not just what your hands do, like in Cain's case where he literally killed his brother, but for all of us to be, um, to be aware. See, there's, there's a, both a moral test, and in this case, it's a social test. Test. What's the social test? How we deal with people. How we deal with people tests what's going on deep within us. And he says it's better to, um, to, to follow the Lord. What did Christ contrast to that? Christ is God's firstborn, and instead of hating and murdering, what's he do? He gives everlasting life. This is how we know what love is. Listen to this. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now, I want you to notice on your outline, they're side by side here. We're not just going down the line. We're going side by side. The firstborn of Adam and Eve and the firstborn of God in this uh, case. So we're talking about Christ, the firstborn of the Lord. This is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us. Mark brought up Mom, John chapter 15, where Jesus said, a new commandment I'm giving to you, that you love one another. That part's not new. That part goes clear back to Leviticus. But he says, love one another as I have loved you. So you've got a model, you've got an example, you've got the leadership that comes from a predecessor, someone who's showing you the way. That's what's new about Jesus' command to love one another. It is sacrificial love. Now, if you think about that for a minute, that's how we know what love is, that he laid down his life for us. That's why we focus every week on Jesus' sacrifice, because that's the only way it's going to make a difference in how we deal with people. If we understand God's love for us and then translate that into our love for people, that's his encouragement. Now, that's hard these days. Isn't that hard these days? You don't have to do it right now, but in the next couple of minutes, look around the room. <laughs> And think about how am I doing at loving my brothers and sisters like Jesus loves us? How am I doing at laying down my life for my brothers and my sisters? Now, very seldom are we called to to, to lay down on a cross and give our lives in literal sense. But every day, every week, every month, Every year we're called upon to serve others, to sacrificially give, to pour ourselves, our lives out in time, in energy, in resources for this. So that's the question. Not, am I laying down on a cross and letting them put nails through my hands? That's not likely to happen. It may, but it's not likely to happen in our culture and time. Every one of us are called on to love like Jesus loved in sacrificial ways. How do we know what love is? By the gift, by the grace, by the mercy and sacrifice of Christ. So let's take two more. Let's take a couple others. This is uh, the origination of sin. The Bible says that the devil is the originator of and he's called the father of lies. And the Bible says he was a murderer from the beginning. In many ways, he's the one that's trying to get your attention 
off of Christ and his sacrifice and onto your selfishness. That's the key thing. It's not just murder. It's selfishness. Instead of putting yourself to death, it's putting yourself in the forefront. This is the message we've heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Don't be like Cain who belonged to the evil one. Evil one. You can tell whose father we are, uh, follow by what we do, by where we are, by how selfish we are. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. See how he's jumping right to that? If you hate somebody <laughs> enough to, we would say enough to kill them, you are a murderer in your heart. And that's where Jesus wanted us to focus. Not the external behavior, but what it's doing, where we're at on the inside, where our heart is. No murderer has eternal life residing in him. When you, and so this is the active tense. It's when you go on fostering hatred in your heart. That's the focus here. Just like earlier, the focus was when you go on practicing sin, you know, the, the everyday use of getting better and better at sin. This is getting better and better at hating people. Focusing and fostering and, and building up hatred. He says, that's going to cause harm. That's going to be murderous. Belonging to the, to the evil one from the beginning. Roots are, the, the roots are, are in, in evil here. Now, we don't want to just say, well, blame the devil. What's the, uh, well, the devil made me do it, you know. The, uh, the focus isn't just to excuse it away by the devil, but rather to say, be clear. When you have those feelings and you're harboring those, you know where the origination of those comes from, where that starts from. So let's contrast that. Skip across the page to God originating love. Now, the Bible's real clear. God is love. Now, take note, it doesn't say, it doesn't flip those around. It doesn't say love is God. It says God is love. Now, sometimes in our culture, especially when it comes to romantic love, there's a lot of people that put love in the idolatry box and say love is God. Some people who want to have a love relationship so bad, that's everything they're focused on. Like love is God. In our culture, we've tended to put the romantic feelings that people have as that's all of what life is about. It's not. That's not what all of life is about. God is love, but love is not God. Are you following that? Don't put love in the place of an idol or follow that. But God is the beginner. He's the leader. He's the model and the planner for us. It says, for let us love one another, for love comes from God. Anytime that we have love growing in our hearts, it's because God is at work. God is growing us to love more. You can tell how strong God is at work by how are you loving or are you growing in your love for other people? We weigh a lot of things. We measure a lot of things. Do you measure the love quotient you have for people, especially people in the body of Christ, people in the church family? Brothers, he says, and sisters. In a distant and and culturally barriered. It's just like the uh, six-foot limit we've been having for our coronavirus safety. So many times, Christians are six feet apart, not getting close enough to love. And so he's encouraging us. Love comes from God. How close did God get? He sent his son to the earth. He sent his son to our world. He sent his son to share in all <laughs> the temptations we go through just like he, he went through, just like we do. Anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So can I encourage you, let your life be weighed and tested and see, do you love? How much love? This is how we know what love is. 
Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Let's uh, talk about the, in a way, the consequences for a minute. Left side of the page. Love versus hate. In this case, hate divides. Jot that down. And hate takes life. Hate divides, see, and takes life. I mean, that's why he's using Cain as the example there. Ultimately, love gives, hate takes. Now, you'll notice there's a progression in this passage because he's going to talk about indifference. He says, if your brother has a need and you ignore him, you'd say, well, that's not really hate. What would you call that? I call it indifference. Indifference. Sometimes the opposite of love is not hate. It's what he's talking about there. It's indifference. But then he does talk about hate, and he talks all the way over to the nth degree of murder. So you got murder, hate, indifference contrasted to love. Love. And here's where he, he really is challenging us. Hate divides. Hate takes life, and it ends up being death. Why do you think Jesus was so intent on the unity of the family of God? He said, the one thing I'm praying for in John 17, as he went to the cross, the, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, the main thing on his heart and mind was the unity and love of the believers for one another. He's the one who said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. So we got to ask ourselves a question in this day in America. Are we living a life so dynamic in love for one another, that the world's looking at the church going, that is the body of Christ. That is the love that God wants the people to have for one another. I encourage you. How's that happen? It happens in small groups. It happens in one-on-one -on -one conversations. It happens in coffee shops where you're looking over into one another's eyes and blessing and encouraging each other. It comes from praying for one another in times of deep distress and need. It comes from Pulling beside one another when it says, bear one another's burdens. Don't look at someone else that has a tough time right now and walk away. Ask, how can I help? What can I do? Instead of indifference or hatred or anger or murder, give them your life. Give up your life. Give up your time. Give up your energy. Hate divides and hate takes life don't be don't be like Cain anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a murderer and you know no murderer has eternal life residing in him last the second part of that is um, since hate divides and takes life love unites and sacrifices this is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material blessings and sees his brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? I heard this week about a couple of um, seminary students. So these guys who were studying to be preachers. And they were at the very end of their uh, studies. And this was like their final exam. And they were supposed to preach on this passage, 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. So the first thing they said was, you need to come at exactly the time we give you to come. You're going to come at 1 o'clock. We gave another student 3 o'clock. It was on a Saturday, so the campus was closed. Nobody else was there. But they were supposed to come at that time and preach their sermon. And based on their sermon, they would either graduate or stay longer in school. Okay? At 1 o'clock, exactly, not early and not late, the first student arrived. And as they got to the uh, door where the exam and the preaching was supposed to take place, nobody else was on campus, they began to grab the doorknob and they heard a crash 
behind him. And there'd been a bicycle crash. An accident had happened. And here was a man kind of laying in pain and, and, and hurting. And the man was faced with the decision. Do I go in and pass the test? Or do I help? And he went in and he preached up a storm. He preached an amazing message from John chapter 3, verses 10. At 3 o'clock, the second seminarian came through. Perfect timing. He was right on time because he was told not to be early, not to be late. Grabbed the door and the staged bicycle accident happened again. Right behind him was a crash and a man writhing in pain, suffering, hurt, And the man was faced with a decision. Do I pass the test and get my seminary credentials? What do I do? In this case, he left the door. He went over and he began to help and find out about this need that was there. And he was late, so he flunked, so to speak, his test. Well, come to find out, the seminary leaders were actually putting to test this very behavior. Can you preach on a subject and not live out a subject? And that's really what this passage is saying. Let's not love in just words. Let's not just love in platitudes and great sayings. Let's love in deed. Let's love in word and deed. Let's put to test Love. Now, so what ended up happening, the first guy who preached the amazing sermon didn't succeed. The other gentleman that thought he'd failed, he got summa cum laude. <laughs> you know, he, he passed with flying colors. Oh, that the people of God would get the idea that it's not about words. It's not about saying we love. It's about accomplishing that in, in, in actuality. It's about investing ourselves, and it's about putting that into action. God wants us to to show love, to show our heart, and let the love of God move us that way. A couple other things here. Left side of the page. Hates motivation (laughs) is sin. For this reason, you've heard from the beginning, love one another. Don't be like Cain. What What happened? Sin took over in his life. In um, the story of Cain, when God comes to him, he says, why are you so downcast? Why has your countenance fallen? Why are you upset? Why are you so angry? He says, don't you know all you have to do is look to me and do what I've asked, and all of this is going to be over. You know, you're, you're getting a consequence you don't have to get if you would just follow my plan. If you would just follow what you... In fact, he says it this way. He says, sin is crouching at the door that he might destroy you. I mean, he tells... God tells Cain that sin is right there, and yet Cain still disobeys. Oh, that we would hear God's voice. Oh, that we would understand his call. Oh, that we would heed his warning. Because the motivation for that is, is sin itself. Whereas love's motivation, God's motivation is love. It's love. Love motivates God's people. And I hope that you and I can experience and go to a different level, a deeper level of understanding, not just on the head, from our heads, but in actuality, living it out. Here's what it says. Lay your life down for your brothers and your sisters. So can I just ask you to take a minute and assess what are you doing this week in laying your life down? It could be materially through the offering, you know, a coin life kind of thing. But I'm really encouraging you to to think outside of that that's so easy for us sometimes, okay? What if we think outside the material 
financial box and think, what am I doing this week to pour my life into others, to bless others like Jesus has blessed me, to give my life away in any respect? Am I serving? That's a big one. Am I washing someone else's feet, figuratively, so to speak? What am I doing to let God use my life as I lay it down for him? Last one. Death always results. Death always results from hate. It may be slow. It may be long. It may be drawn out. But death is the end result. We know that we pass from death to life. Because what's the end result of not following Christ? It's death. It's eternal death. It's everlasting death. It's death that is not quenched. Anyone who does not love remains. Did you catch that? Anyone who does not love remains in what? Death. Nobody wants to live there. Nobody wants to say it. Remember, be warned, be encouraged. What's the opposite of that? Eternal life. Eternal life. Always, when we love, life springs from that. We love the brothers and that we abide. Underline that part. He who, um, the results of life, he who does not love does not abide in life, but abides in death. Into life we love. So that's the, uh, the contrast between love and hate, between life and death, between God's plan for us and our selfishness and our plans for ourselves. Let's bow in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for this passage that encourages us to see life like you see it. Help us not to be in the gray area, but to strive to see our lives fully devoted to you, loving and enjoying your love, passing your love on to brothers and sisters. Father, would you this week, would you this um, season, this month, this year, would you allow us to experience all that you have in store for us? Help us to love people in brand new and vibrant ways. Help us never settle for words alone. Help us to love in deed and in action. Help us to give our lives away as you've called us to. We pray this, Lord. We pray we'd be a dynamic fellowship because of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.